My name is John Papa and I work for Microsoft as a developer advocate. One of the reasons I like working for Microsoft as a developer advocate or in DevRel if you will is because I get to come out here and talk to the community. My favorite thing to do is to get excited about technology and then share it with everybody and then gather feedback and then kind of repeat that process. So it's something I really enjoy doing and I'm going to share with you some ideas that I've done over the years on building architectures uh, specifically using Node and JavaScript here, but these patterns apply to .NET, Java, PHP, whatever you might be doing. Uh, not sure about COBOL, but uh, <laughs> we'll cover the rest. So the idea here is when you're building an architecture, and we all have one, we just may have less things in some and more in others. When you build one, do you want to have a full-blown app server on the back end, or should you look at serverless technology to solve some of the problems that you've been dealing with? for the last decade or so. So that's what we're going to talk about here. And how do you build web apps today? I'll bet you if I asked you all and interviewed you all individually, I would probably get about 100 different answers because there's so many variations in how you can build something. This is why it's, it frustrates me and gets me excited when people ask me at work sometimes, well, how does the typical developer deploy a web app? Like, there is no such thing as the typical developer. What's common sense to you is like, oh yeah, I just pressed a button, it goes to Git and it goes to the cloud. What cloud? Through a Git deploy? Is there an NPM build package? Are you using NuGet in that process? What about Maven? Is there CI? What about CD? There's so many different ways you can do things. And then what about Docker? What about Kubernetes? Whew, so many things out there these days. Long gone are the days of press F5 and things just don't work, right? <laughs> don't work. <laughs> So really, the questions we should be asking, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back and forth between some demos today and some things to think about, but I want to really circle on these things. First, static content and web APIs. Are they the same thing and do they have the same purposes? Think about the web apps you've built. They often have HTML, CSS, things like that in them. That's the static content. But then there's data that they have to go get. So are they hitting third-party APIs, APIs you wrote? Are they RESTful? Is it JSON? Is it XML? What is it? When you're getting data, are those the same types of things as getting HTML? Well, in the, in the end, it's all data, right? But how often do you go get HTML from your website? Think about a single user. How many times, even with things like lazy loading these days, do they actually go get content that's static. Once, a couple times, not many. How many times do they hit your endpoints for your APIs for data? A lot? Yeah, probably more times than people we have in this room over the course of using their app. So the frequency and they get the data, the things they have to do when they get the data, the way you secure that data, you want to secure that much more securely than you do just getting HTML, all the things that you do with that data have different things they have to funnel through. So maybe putting them all in a generic web server isn't the right solution. One size doesn't always fit all. I want to talk about that today as we look at some of the solutions. Well, we're talking about servers, and I just mentioned maybe we need two servers, one to serve static content, one to serve your APIs. Well, that's two. Well, what if you have multiple environments? And now you've got four environments, two servers each, that's eight. Light and dark, load balancing, testing, QA, staging, development, production. If you've got a lot of environments. Do servers need maintenance? Maybe you don't do it at your company and you don't care. Maybe you do and you do care. Uh, maybe the people signing the checks at your company care how many servers you're getting. So the curiosity here is when you need maintenance in your servers, how do you handle this? Also, security updates and patches. And then how many servers do you really need? This isn't a goal to get down to one, and it's not a goal to go to 100, but it's getting the right mixture. So we're going to focus on these three questions throughout the different parts of the talk today. <coughs> the first thing we're going to explore is a server, a web server, app server, using Node and Express as the API. The app I'm going to start showing, and I'll show you Angular, React, and Vue today. Does anybody do web technology beyond Angular, React, and Vue in this room today? All right, cool. I've covered at least most of you then, right? <laughs> I can throw in Svelte at the last minute if we've got 10 minutes, maybe. 
All right, so we're going to look at Node and Express and how this works. And the first demo we'll look at, we'll show Angular first. We're going to look at a Node server using TypeScript. I'm using TypeScript just because, because it could have been JavaScript, either way. Uh, we're using Node.js, obviously, and we'll show a little debugging because it's, if you can't debug multiple uh, pieces of your architecture, it kind of breaks things down. So. Here is the Angular app, and before I get too far in any of my talks, I'd like to point out that every single thing you see me do today, I'm going to give you a link to try it. There's a tutorial that you can try, and then there's the actual code which you can download and try. So at the end of the talk, I'll give you links to all this stuff and give it a go. This app here is just a plain old Angular app. Let's go look at what it's actually doing. This is the view of the Angular app. This one happens to be running in the cloud right now, just so I can show you an end result. And the app has heroes and it has villains. Here's our heroes. If you're familiar with the Viking show and history channel, there you go. Uh, and then the villains, there's me and two of my coworkers. <laughs> so nobody ever wants to be a villain, so I'm like, ah, I'll just pick on myself. All right, so up here we've got our villains, we've got our heroes, and then, by the way, the About screen also gives you links to things that you can go try and do and all the resources as well. So how does this look inside the code? Let's zoom in over on the left, and we'll break those down. I always like to start by looking at what does the structure of an app look like? You'll notice we've got this source folder. The source folder is where our Angular app is. Nothing to see here, really. It's just where you're going to put your client-side app. And then I've got my environment files inside my Angular app. When I'm running in dev, my APIs are hitting API, local host. When I'm running in prod, I'm going to go hit a real server. So I got environment files for it. Pretty standard stuff. And then I've got this server folder. In my server folder, I have, make that go away, Express, Node Express. It's effectively running my app and it's serving up my APIs. And in my APIs, I've got this routes file. We'll just look at the heroes. And when you go to slash heroes, it's going to call this service that says get my heroes. This is all on the server in Node. What does get heroes do? If I click on that, I'm inside my hero service for my Node server. Think of this as a controller, maybe if you're using ASP.NET. Get heroes accepts the request. I then make an asynchronous call to go hit my database, which will go get my data for my heroes, bring it back, return a response, and a status of 200. Pretty typical stuff, right? So all that's running inside my node server. And the key to this is that I've got services and I've got routes. The routes are what are the URLs going to be that we hit. The services are how do I actually go get the data or the puts, the posts, the deletes that people are asking for. And then finally, just to show that it's a real type of app, we're going to come down here to the root. I'm going to show you not my environment file, but an example. So I've got an env file for my node server that points to what ports am I running on, what's my database key, what's my database URL. This is where you put your uh, sensitive information that is git ignored, right? Uh, you do not want to put this into your git repo. And if you do, get rid of it and change it quick. All right, so all that's running on the back end. Now if I want to run this, there's a couple ways you can do it. If you're like me, you get what I call NPM script insanity. You end up with all these scripts and how you can start your apps up. What we want to do is really focus on one of them down here. And I'll zoom in on it for you. It's called node debug. What node debug is going to do locally is I want to run the node server and debug it. So I'm going to tell it where is my app located. It's in this folder. Then run node. I'm running a package called .env, which is going to then look at that env file to look up my database connections. So I can pass them into my node server. And then I'm also turning on the debugging flag. Little things that we do in Node to just make sure things work. And then when we're done, we should be able to run our application. So up here in the debugging pool, this is inside of VS Code, you'll notice I have all these debugging configurations. I don't like to run the app unless I know I can debug it. The first one says launch a node server. I can run that node server right here by clicking on that and then selecting the green arrow. I press the button. 
We'll kind of make it smaller so you can see what's going on over here. And we should be debugging. Notice right here it says it's listening on 7627. And if I go over to an app called Insomnia, which hopefully none of you have, not the app, but the disease, right? Right here, if I call that with this URL up top, I should get heroes. We press send, boom, I'm debugging right inside my app over here. I can then highlight values, should be undefined. I can actually right click over on the right hand side, choose add inline breakpoint. So if I want to break inside the asynchronous action, it adds the breakpoint over there as well. I hit run. And looks like I hit it too late. Should have hit it over here. And when it comes back, it has my heroes, and then the app returns the data right there. So I can debug through Postman or Insomnia, whatever tools you happen to like to use. But what if, let's kill these, what if I want to debug both Angular and Node at the same time? Is it possible? It is. So I'm going to select that one. I'm going to press Run. And a couple things are going to happen. Down below, it's kicking up my Node server to debug it, just like it did before. But it's also building my Angular app at the same time in a different process. And then it's going to connect those two and let me debug both at the same time inside of VS Code. How does this work? Cool. Let's go look at the solution here. We've got our app running in VS Code. It's paused. It hit a breakpoint in my Angular component right here. And then I press Run. And now it hit a breakpoint inside my function or my uh, node service right there. Front end, back end debugging all at the same time. Everything's good. You'll notice I've got this little drop down in my debugger as well. Have you ever seen the little debugging breakpoint that's red and then sometimes it's gray with a hollow circle? If you don't know what I mean, it's scary. Let me show you. What's that thing over there? What does that mean? You're hosed, right? means the debugger is never going to hit that breakpoint. This is the one time you shouldn't worry about it. And the reason is because VS Code can only look at one context at a time. It can run them both, but it can only see one at a time. So if you click over onto Node Server or back to Launch Angular, you'll see which one is red or not. Um, it doesn't have to be red to hit it. It'll still hit it as it goes through. And then when you're done, you can run the app. And if I press Refresh up here, we'll again see that the breakpoints are hit. There's the Angular one. There's the node server one, and we're good to go. And then I can kill them both up here, get rid of my terminals, and we're all back to normal. The way you can make this work, because this is very powerful, is inside your launch JSON file. How do you get to this point? Let's back up. Over here, you'll see this little bug. These are new icons, by the way, in Visual Studio Insider. Uh, this will come out at the end of the month, I believe, for the stable version of VS Code. But you hit the debug icon right here. And then you'll see this drop down. If there's nothing in your drop down, just hit this little wheel up here, the settings wheel. And that'll open up the launch JSON file. If there's nothing in there, it'll actually open this little drop down. And then you can choose, well, what are you trying to do? In this case, you could say, well, I'm doing node and I want to run the process, like load node launch via NPM. And that's what I chose right here. It gives it a name, says use NPM, and then run which script node debug. That's it. And music starts in the background. <laughs> and then you can launch Angular. The launch Angular one is a little bit more work, not too much. You say NPM start, and you tell it what folder to start in. That's the default. But you have to give it the URL. If you're like me and you don't want to remember any of the syntax, let's say you didn't have launch Angular. If you use the snippets that I've created, which you can find in the VS Code Marketplace called Angular Essentials. You'll see you can add a Chrome launch debugging uh, setup, or you can add one for Edge, which also supports debugging. So you just hit that, tap it, and then it gives you all the prompts. And by default, it's exactly what I had before without the comma. And then you can debug both there. But that's one at a time. At the bottom, you'll notice something else here. We've got something called a compound. In VS Code, it lets you have a compound debugging statement where you name it whatever you want, and then you just simply add the configurations you want to run. So when you have the configurations, as you type them in here, notice it's prompting me for all the different debugging configurations in this file. 
I can then just say launch the node server and then let's say launch Angular and press save and it's good. So now it's going to do both debugging at the same time for me. So I don't have to go debug one and press the other and kind of do it all. So remember I said F5 never works. Now F5 would work. So all I have to do is press F5 and that debugging configuration kicks off. It builds a node app, builds the Angular app in this case, and then it launches it in the browser, and then you've got all your breakpoints that you can hit. So I'm going to kill this because we've seen that before. And it's confused, so I'm going to kill it. There we go. So the key to this, though, is that you've got a node server and you've got an Angular server in your app. How are you going to deploy this node server to the cloud? Is the node server going to serve the Angular app? What is the node server really doing? The node server is the connection point between the Angular app and my database. I'm trying to get my app some data. And I want people to be able to see my HTML. That's really what it's trying to do if you break it down. So when we do this, we have to think about what's required. Well, until recently with serverless technologies and some other tech, really it had to have a server, whether it's ASP.NET or PHP or whatever you use. So I have to build a node server to kind of put all this stuff together. And then I have to decide, do I get that node server to the cloud inside of Docker? Absolutely fine way of doing it. Docker is great because it works everywhere the same way. You don't have to worry about whose OS is running on or what version of Node you have installed or anything. You define it, it's good. And deploy it to a cloud. Or you could deploy loose files. Just take your actual Node files and effectively X copy them either through GitHub or a CI process to the cloud. That works too. It's just in that case, you have to know what version of Node and OS you're running, et cetera. But really, are we doing much with that server? I'd argue we're not. So let's think about this in a different way. If we look at architecture and the last 15 years, that's pretty much what we've built. We've been building apps that run on a web server, serve static content, have some kind of API that we hit, and we call it a day. And if it ain't broke, don't, you know, why fixing it, right? Ain't broken. Maybe it is a little broken, though. Do you always need a server? Let's walk through some scenarios and find out. Here's what we often envision. That could be .NET, it could be Java, it could be PHP, whatever makes you happy. So we've got the standard setup, multiple web browsers, multiple clients, maybe even mobile clients, and then they all hit some back end. And generally, when somebody says to you, I've got an API and I'm going to get the data, you always assume it's JSON, right? But those of us who work for large companies who have old systems, is it always JSON? <laughs> no. Is it fun parsing XML and JSON together? <laughs> no. So we often envision that, but what we end up with something like this. I've worked at some pretty big companies, and when you come into a big company, they've got legacy code, or classic is the nicer way of saying it these days. These classic architectures, and you get uh, hired as a consultant or an employee to come in and build something for them. They're often thinking about some new UI they want and some new logic, but they're like, you know what, we've already got these databases and these other APIs. We've already got a Java server serving up how you get like the hotel reservation for this hotel, let's say. And we've already got a .NET server that gets like the customer information for their checking in. And we used to use PHP, and that thing's holding up most of the user information for the website. Now we just want to put a new site together. You've got three different back ends, and one's coming in XML, one's coming in JSON, and hopefully one's not coming in like fixed length format files or anything like that. <laughs> but it could be. And what do we end up doing? We end up building with this because that's what we're hired to do. You can't always change the back ends of the architecture that you're working with. You get a lot of calls. I recently had to work with an app where there was a mobile app that a client or a customer wanted us to put on so they could have a mobile client. They figured it was easy. It was easy. We built the app really quickly. And when I was talking to the web developers because they were having a problem with performance on it, I started looking at the issues. One of the issues was, and I'll use the hotel as an example for this. They had to go get who you were when you were checking in. They had to find out who the people were that were with you, what rooms you were in, what car was you parked in in the parking lot, how long are you here, and what restaurants did you eat at. 
Every one of those was a different call to a different database server in the back end. And some of those were sequential, not simultaneous. And all of them returned back way more data than you ever possibly needed because they were hitting APIs that were not built for what you were doing. For example, just to get the name of the person, they were hitting a customer record which brought back a half a meg of Jason. <laughs> John Papa. <laughs> okay, just think about the size. Overall, there were seven calls in this app that were going on and there was over four meg of data coming across the wire on a mobile app, not on Wi-Fi, on cell coverage. And they didn't hit this until they tried it in the field, thankfully before they went live. Because it was taking minutes. Timeouts were hitting. Everything was going bad. Data saver was kicking on on some of the phones for some of the trials that they had. The format of the data was being parsed in the client. Someone was coming across as XML. They wrote JavaScript to parse the XML and then turn it into JSON and then merge it with their JSON and then trim out the pieces that they wanted. These things sound like common sense. But put yourself in their shoes. If you were told, build the UI and there's your back ends, you cannot change the back ends, what would you do? This is not bad developer syndrome. This is, oh my gosh, I'm going to get paid for what I actually do now to solve a problem. So we get these situations. It would be nice if we could have something that would aggregate that data, secure the back ends, because some of those may not have security up to date. They've been around for a long time transform the data from whatever format they are in and possibly reduce the data sets. And this is where uh, the idea of what, there's a lot of names this goes by, I call it a presentation API. A presentation API sits between all those disparate back ends for you and your client. It's a server. In this case it could be a Node Express server because why not have a fourth technology, right? So let's say it's a Node Express server and it's going off. It's making all those calls because those APIs can't change, right? It's making all the calls, bringing the data back on a server. What's the connection speed between the mobile client and the server? Slow. What's the connection speed between your server and your server? Fast, right? So it can make the calls to get the data. It can aggregate, transform, reduce, do what it needs to do, trim down everything to get the words John and Papa and bring that up to the client. What you're doing is you're building an API that's built for UIs. It's a presentation API. So with this model, this is why things like Node, Go in some cases, uh, and also serverless functions really play well into this model. Because they're really good at making these types of API calls and really fast at getting them. And in the end, if it looks confusing, this is what your client sees. Think about building a UI. React, Angular, Vue, Svelte, knock, Knockout, Backbone, Durandal, whatever else is out there, Aurelia, um, CanJS, Batman. <laughs> so many different things. You think I'm making these up, look them up. So <laughs> if you look, the, look at these, when you're building with the UI, a lot of times UI developers want to build their UIs and know what the APIs are going to return. Are the APIs always done too? No. But if you have a single API you're designing, you can mock those APIs, build the UI very quickly, and then glue the presentation API to that back end later when you need to. But this makes life a lot easier for client type of applications. Is this overkill if you have one database, one app server, and a client? Yeah, it is. There is no one size fits all in technology. This is why we're all employed. But this does help when you have these large architectures. So we talked about exploring Node and Express in this context. We looked at what a Node Express server could look like. Pretty simple, the request comes in a node. We have the Express package that runs. Express looks at it, figures out if it's a put, post, get, delete, what it's doing. Looks at the route, figures out you wanted a hero, I'll go get you the heroes list. Points the route over to the service, which then hit, talks to a database and gets our data. Pretty standard stuff. But what about things like static storage? Does Express really need to serve the HTML? Does ASP.NET really need to serve your HTML? It's a file. What if you could serve it off of static storage or and or a CDN? 
Just because you have a server doesn't mean that it's built the same way. We just talked about all the needs of a data API, transformation, security, reducing data, aggregation, so much stuff you gotta do, talking to databases. A lot of error handling and business logic too. Your HTML have any of that? I hope not. It could, but I hope not. So static storage is a really nice way to look at how you get fast web servers. And then another option, serverless functions. What if you don't want to set up things like Express or ASP.NET to run the APIs on the back end or any of those servers? Where does serverless fit into this play? That's what I'm going to talk about next on this. So a lot of people like to talk about serverless as there are no servers. Well, that's not true. Doesn't mean you don't have them, it just means you think about them less. Serverless technology effectively means they've moved the servers to um, a SaaS type platform, if you will, right? What it really means is somebody else is setting up the servers for you. You just write the code and push the code. And what do you guys all do again? You're developers, right? Or you work for development shops and you're paid to put code together and push it up. You're paid to manage the projects that push code. Are you paid to keep an eye on servers? Maybe, and that's okay. But even with that, network infrastructure can be looked at with scaling with serverless. So why would you think about these at all? Here's just a couple reasons. Security, first of all. Have you ever had a server that you've had to host somewhere, whether it was hosted in a cloud or on a VM or even local that you do on-prem? And you have to worry about patches for security. And then you have to get up at, it's always like 2 a.m. on a Friday night for whatever reason. You always have to get up then because some 15-year-old kid is sitting playing video games and they decided to hack your servers and you got a security issue. Well, with serverless, you don't have to worry about these things because the servers are managed for you. And you have less issues with it. Super high performance because the serverless, you don't have to worry about, do we have one server or 10? And is that one server fast enough for what we need? They automatically get scaled for what you need to do, so you get the high scaling too. And with the high scaling, you could be like Walmart on Black Friday, or Amazon, or whoever you shop from, on Black Friday where you've got tons of scalability spinning up, and then on the other days it scales back down automatically, and there's very little for you to do. And as part of that, which is really nice, is you get low cost. So I've worked for some of these companies where they have Black Friday sales, and you know, they need hundreds of servers on those days. They don't want to pay for those all year round. You don't have to worry about that stuff when you're doing serverless. Another great piece of this is I've written apps for companies who literally only would run an app for a week or two a year. But during that week, they had millions of people hit it. So it wasn't a toy app. It was a very real serious business app that during Christmas in the entertainment industry, a lot of people visit a certain place in this state and that place has certain sites that run that need to be up for that week or two. So you can enjoy your Christmas time or holidays. And then afterwards, it goes away. The nice thing about that is the other 50 weeks a year, there's zero cost because it's not running. Regardless of the serverless architecture you use when they have auto scaling, that's the idea of auto scaling. Amazon, Azure, Netlify, whoever you use. If you're not using them, you're not paying for them. How's that go with servers? You have one, you have to pay for it. So the idea here is pretty cool. It's like, all right, well, I got less to think about. It's fast, it scales, and it doesn't cost much. There's a term that came out called the Jamstack. Uh, it's very nifty in this JavaScript world to come up with cool names. So that's what it is. It's called the Jamstack. And what does it mean? I like to call them serverless web apps because it more describes like what they do. It's when you take serverless apps and web apps and put them together. So the J in Jamstack stands for JavaScript. It's when you've got JavaScript in your apps. Check the box there. We've got Angular, React, or Vue. Do we have APIs? That's effectively what we've been talking about most of the day here. Sure we do. And do you have markup? HTML in our case, right? Our static content. We've got some Jam. That's what the Jamstack stands for. I like to call these serverless because to me, that's really the way they're going to be implemented. So what would this look like for Angular, React, or Vue, though? 
how would you have an app, whereas in a moment ago we just looked at a full-blown node server that I'd have to pay for, and when you choose a server in the cloud, you have to choose a plan, don't you? Whatever cloud provider you go with. How big is that server going to be? How beefy? And you have to figure out, well, maybe I want the four core. I don't know, last time we had a four core was a little slow on certain busy days. Maybe we should get the eight core. And you've got to start deciding how much to pay for. When you build your own server, these are the things you have to go into it. So let's take a look at what we do again. Remember, we talked about this presentation API and what our client sees. Now let's take a look at our Angular, React, or Vue app. We'll use Node. Instead, we're going to use, let me clarify that, we're going to use Node technology. We're not going to use a Node server. We're going to use storage to host our application. We're going to use TypeScript because we're going to use serverless functions because that's what we're going with this. We're trying to get away from the server side. And we're going to see if we still get the same stuff we had before, which is full-blown debugging. Because, again, if we don't have a server and we can't really run it, it's all in the cloud, how are you supposed to actually like, fix your code? I don't know about you, but I make more mistakes a day than I would humility allows me to tell people. <laughs> so debugging is a good thing. All right, so just to show you what's going to happen here, if I could find which one of my 22 desktops it is, we'll get rid of this. This was the Angular app running in the cloud. I like to color code things. The Angular app running in storage right now. And I'm going to refresh that. Over here, this is the view version of the same app. Notice it's green for view. And here is the React version of the same app. And that one's running locally, just because I have to show something local. All right, so we'll go back down. So you have three versions of the app. And you'll see this throughout the code today. Anything red is going to be Angular. Anything green is going to be view. Anything blue is going to be React. Guess which app this one is? View. What's that? React. React and Angular. Awesome. Now you guys know why I wrote Peacock. If you know what Peacock is, check it out. So here is the app. It's running up in storage right here. Notice the URL I get. Of course, you can get your own custom URLs. You can put um, security certificates on them, etc. cetera. Uh, that's fine. But right now, this is my storage URL, and I want to hit an API in the cloud. My API is running with functions in the cloud. So here's the real catch of all this. When I go back to VS Code, everything was running on a server. So I get this question a lot. John, are you telling me that I have to rewrite my entire Node Express server in something like serverless technology? And the answer is yes. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. But is it really that hard? Let me show you what it takes to do that. First, there's an extension. That's the Azure symbol. An extension called Azure Tools, which I'll give you the link to, where all you do is you click on this extension in VS Code, and you'll see a bunch of panes over here. Function storage, Cosmos, app service. App service is basically your, your full-blown node server could be there. And inside of functions, what you do is you click this button right there. Create a new project. It'll create the new functions app for you with everything you need out of the box. Once you do that, you click this button to create a function for every new function you need. Get the heroes, save the heroes, delete the heroes, throw them up in the air, whatever makes happiness. And what do you think this arrow pointing at the ceiling means? Push it to the cloud. Yep. And this one means run around in circles like a dog chasing your tail. <laughs> so those buttons will give you everything you need that you want to run. Now, what does that mean once you get there? This is the app that I actually pushed. It's already in the cloud. And my functions are here, and they're read-only. Why are they read-only? Because I pushed them from here. Notice I have a folder called Functions. When I created the Functions app, I shoved it in a folder called Functions, because it lets you. And then it created, for every function I created, I created eight. Here is get, post, put, delete. And I kept them separate just to make them clear. I probably wouldn't do that in a real app. Probably consolidate them. But here's my get heroes. This functions JSON defines how the function works. If we click on that, this file's filled in for you just like this. It points out your authorization level, which you can change. Is it an HTTP trigger? Yes. It's an input function? Yep. I'm only supporting get. 
That's all I want to be able to go here. And I want you to route to heroes. I don't want it to route to heroes-get. I'm just showing you how you can rename it. The only line of code I changed was line 10 because I didn't want it to be called heroes-get. And then inside that file, you have this file. There's a lot of code in here, so hold back. This entire file was generated for you except for two things. Line eight right there and then line two which is the import for it. So what this is doing is this is the route. This maps one to one with what I already put in express. So what did I have to do so far to get here? Generate the app, create eight endpoints. Press the button eight times. Name them, heroes get, heroes delete, heroes update, etc. I still have to make them do something though. And we all know that the routes are the easy part in setting up routing on, a, on an API. The hard part is what is it going to do once it gets there? So what is this doing? This is the good question. Let me open this one up and I'm going to put it in a side panel over here. And we're also going to open up what we did over in Node. So here's my server. There's my service called Hero Service right here. Let me zoom out on these. Does it look like I have the same file open? There are two differences in this file. I was able to literally copy the file from Node Express over to the function. Literally. All I had to change, if I zoom in up here, is when I went to Express, I was importing request and response from Express. When I go over to the other one, I import this thing called context from Azure Functions. It's a different object. I still want to get request response though. So the second thing I had to do was over on the right, you'll notice my get heroes function was getting the request and response as a parameter. But when I go to Azure Functions, I change that to do this syntax. This is called destructuring. Because I have a context object, the context object in Azure Functions wraps up the request and response. So I'm just pulling those two out. Not another line of code has to change. So copy, paste, change one line of code. You could even write a little function to go automate that if you wanted to. Pretty easy to do. And in fact, just so easy it was, I left the commented line up top just so I'd remember it in case I ever wanted to copy it back and do something else. Now I use TypeScript to do this. So I left TypeScript in Node and I put TypeScript in functions. But if I started with JavaScript in Node, I could have done the same thing just using JavaScript with the functions. So once you have all those, that's it. All you have to do is go back to your routes, which we had here. And remember, in the route, we just had to call. OK, you're going to go get the heroes? Just call my service and go get the heroes and pass the context. Nothing else changes. And when you're done, you just push it up. What does pushing it look like? We can go back over to here. We can right click on our function, or we can press that arrow right there. We can say deploy to the function app. And that'll push that app up to the cloud. It takes about 60 seconds for me on average. I've done it about 10 times today. And it's taking from 30 seconds to a minute and a half. So hotel Wi-Fi, forgiving. You might also wonder, though, I, I focused a lot of time on environment variables. How does the functions know about the environment variables when Node knew from a .env file? And that would be a great question. So the other thing we have to do is remember back in our main app, we have these env files so our Node app knows where Cosmos is. These are important for your apps. You should absolutely never put your security inside your app. Always externalize it. So these keys had to be loaded. They're not being loaded anymore. So what you do with functions is they have this file called local settings, which you can now see part of my key. You have half my secrets. So over here on the right, it's the same thing effectively. It's just you put those environment variables in this values object. So a quick copy paste, put them over there is good. All of that is omitted from Git as well. And then when you have Azure functions, you notice over here, Kill that. These application settings are showing up here, and they're hidden by default for security, which I really like. So I don't have to change my keys after every demo now. <laughs> so all those are actually hidden. How do they get in the cloud for functions from that file? 
When you deploy, you can tell them to upload them. If you want new ones, you just right click it and you can upload local settings. What if you lost the settings and you need them? Have you ever done this where it worked locally, then you did a git pull on someone else's machine and that file doesn't come down because it's been git ignored? And you're like, oh no, you don't have all the security database keys and stuff. What am I going to do? Well, what you could do is just say download the remote settings. And now you can get those files yourself, which is really, really nice. So what about debugging, the final frontier? Remember we had these configurations? Well, one of them is called launch Angular and functions. When you create a function app, it automatically creates this debug configuration for functions. There's nothing to do there. It'll debug them for you. We already know how to create one for Angular. We can use the snippet to do that. Then at the bottom, we just create a compound that puts those two together. And now, when I go run my app, it'll hit the functions. But there's one thing you should all be thinking about. John, that's not going to work. And you're right. That's because when I run my app, my Angular app needs to know where my back end is. So my Angular app right now is looking at this target. That was my API, my endpoint, my port for my Node app. I saved one up here for my function. My function is going to run in this port. So now I'm just going to change the port that my Angular app has to look at so it knows where to look for this code. So by doing that, all I have to do is go back, run launch Angular and functions, press the green button, zoom out, let it do its thing. It should build Angular, build the uh, functions. And this one usually takes a little bit. Ah, something died. That's not good. It built Angular. The functions didn't go. Yes, Angular, I see you. Let's try it again. This is live coding. And we'll try it one more time. There's already a debug configuration. Yeah, I know that. It still thinks it's running, that's why. Try it one more time. If that doesn't work, we'll give it pass. One of the problems of running so many debug demos in the same machine is you end up using all your ports up. Yeah, OK. It's dead. She's dead, Jim. It works. <laughs> Believe me, it does. Yeah, and if that worked, what you'd see is right here, this is the function app, the same line of code with the breakpoint, and it would hit that in breakpoint for you. But you might be wondering, once you get it up into storage and you get it up in functions, how do you actually make them talk to each other? Because if you look at the app that we have here, notice my storage URL is this URL. And it's hitting an API that's at a different URL. What happens in the web world when you have the API and the, yeah, the website on different ports or URLs? Cores. And I don't mean beer. Cores. So cores issues happen. What you need to do in that case is you can go up to things like the Azure portal or whatever tools you're using. I'm going to turn on cores. And it's going to say, hey, what do you want to do? I want to allow it. And then over here on the right, you can see all the different source URLs that I'm allowing to hit my API. And you can set this up so it does that. Once I do that, this one here, which is Angular, can hit it. Here's the view one. Notice it's also running in storage. It can also hit it. I'll refresh. And then here's my React one. And this one is just running locally for now. With the view one, all I had to do to push up to storage again if you've written view apps, you just right click on the disk folder. It's another way you can do it instead of going to the uh, Azure extension. And see down here, deploy to static website, you just click on that button. That's it. When you click on that button, I'm going to go a little low tech here for a minute. I'm going to show you what happens. These are called screenshots. Because I don't want to risk the cloud right now. So in the screenshot, the first thing it's going to say is after it deploys that storage, to say, do you want to enable web hosting on this storage site? Because storage can store anything, images, whatever. And I said yes. The second question, enter the name of the page you want us to launch. The default is index.html. If you roll differently, you would enter that in there. Next, this is super important. 
If you're writing Angular, Vue, or React, and you want routing to work with history mode, where somebody refreshes the URL, it actually goes back and reruns the app and goes to the right URL, it wants to know here, and it's not worded the way I'd like it to be worded, but we'll get there. You enter in the page that you want to run when there is a 404 on the server, effectively. That's going to allow you to have that routing. And then finally, again, very important, what code do you want to deploy? You point it at the folder to deploy. If you right click it like I did on the disk folder, it wouldn't ask you this question because it knows what folder. But if you go into the extension and you just say upload, it doesn't know where the code is in your project. So it asks you. So that's how that worked with the Angular one. With the view, and we just right click and, and do that with dist. Here we go with React. This is not in the cloud yet. All I'd have to do is right click on build, choose deploy to static website, choose a storage account. Wi Fi is on, thank God. There we go. We'll create a new one here. Call it Papa, code on the beach, storage, 003 because that's an awesome name. We'll choose West US for that server and East US for the storage. Now this is going to take a moment. It's creating the storage account from scratch. The first time it takes a minute because it's got to go create these resources and then it's going to push the files up. But the nice thing is if we go back to like the view app, if I right click and do the same thing, deploy to static website, we can just say, I think it was 02, should have named it view. Does that look familiar from the Snagit? It says, hey, I'm going to delete everything on your server and redeploy. OK, sure, go for it. So view is working on that. Over here, here's my React app. The React app has never existed in the cloud, so it's asked me, do you want to enable the hosting? Yes. Do you want to use index.html? Yes. Reload that? Yes. And notice it's not asking me what folder to put it in. That's because I right clicked on the build folder. So now it's deploying everything. And once it's up there, I'll be able to browse the website, assuming cores was set up. Yes, I set up cores. <laughs> so React works in the cloud now, too. So it's all pretty quick. There's the view one. We already saw the view one before. And that one works, too. So view, React, Angular, it doesn't matter what you're doing. All these can work up there. They just all have to point their environment files to point to the cloud. Uh, example of that here is in the View app. Uh, where is the ENVs? There we go. In the View app, notice I had to change my environment variable for View to point to the URL for where my functions are, because your app needs to know. Another option, if you don't want to use cores or do something like this, is you can get a, a tool uh, like Amazon, Azure, all of them have it, where basically it's a reverse proxy that sits on top of your APIs and your HTML, so it can do that work for you. Uh, cores is the easy way to do it. Setting up routing like that in reverse proxies takes a little more work. Oops. Cool. So I promised I'd show you some real demos of all three of these, show how they work, um, and also think about some of these problems we have and when you could use each. We should really touch back on them and see which one we should use. Uh, the debugging in VS Code, it mostly worked. That was great. We can debug both at the same time, which I really like. The big tips I have for you are these three. Consider a presentation API, regardless of whether you're doing serverless or you're doing full back end. If you have the scenario we laid out, where you've got different back ends with different APIs and you're getting a lot of data, even if you only have one back end, but you're not allowed to touch it and you're looking for, how can I make a mobile web app that only gets this little bit of data, like 5K of data or less, but my data is coming back right now and it's half a meg? How can I deal with that? One way to do that is presentation API. Reducing the file load, reducing the number of calls, securing it, transforming data, aggregating calls. Does all that stuff for you. If you want to deal with less servers, serverless and storage are a great way to look at that as well. You could literally run the site that I just ran. Those three storage sites and function sites are going to cost me about three cents this month. Three cents. Because I'm not going to hit them a whole lot, right? And even if somebody else hits them, it's not going to do much. Functions are really super cheap. So is storage on pretty much every cloud platform you go to. Super fast, and then you can turn on super scaling with it as well. And then you can attach a CDN, which I would recommend. 
uh, as well as custom URLs. If you need more control, I'm not saying servers aren't good. Sometimes you do need them. Sometimes that's what you're dealing with. If you want full control, what I recommend is using your favorite backend technology, putting it inside of something like Docker, and then using like Kubernetes to host it in the cloud, picking your favorite cloud provider. Full-blown backend server structures give you fine-tuned control over what's happening with every request, every data call, everything you're doing. You get to own the whole story from beginning to end. So there's reasons to have all of these. But I really urge you to look at this model and consider the next time you build one of these new apps or build onto an existing app, of whether or not you should go serverless with storage or choose traditional. And definitely recommend doing a presentation API. So if you want to try all these things, I promise I give you tutorials. This tutorial will tell you how to do everything I did with the static sites. There's not a lot of work. You right click some buttons and you push it to the cloud. There's also the CLI that you can use to do that. If you want to try the serverless stuff that I did, there's a tutorial that you can go hit. You'll notice a the theme with the URLs. If you want to uh, use the extensions that I showed you today, definitely pull down the extensions. They're all free in the marketplace for VS Code. Uh, that'll give you the storage and the Azure Functions stuff. If you like the color coding of VS Code today, Peacock is an extension I wrote to do that. Uh, if you don't have Azure and you want to try it, because yes, to use Azure you need to have an account, there's a free trial here. Shh, don't tell anybody I gave it to you. And then all the code you saw, there's actually three repositories, actually four. Um, but if you go up to this link, this is the main repository and it has links to every other repository. Because I showed you a lot today. So there's a lot up there. Uh, with that, I really hope you try all this out. Give it a shot. If it doesn't work, find me on Twitter. My name is John Papa. Um, if you really don't like it, my name is Scott Hanselman. <laughs> and I hope to talk to you more this weekend. Thanks.